You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and this is a conversation with the wonderful Norwegian artist, Mortis. The reason for the conversation is to promote his upcoming Australian tour. I'll read out some dates. All are occurring in July of 2018. The first date is the 25th in Perth. Then it's the 26th in Brisbane. The 27th is in Sydney. The 28th is in Melbourne. The 29th is in Hobart. And finally, the 30th is in Adelaide. So let's have a listen to what he's got to say. Here we go. Hey, man. Yeah, I'm good. Good. How are you going? Oh, yeah, not too bad. I've uh, just come from a bloody dentist appointment, mate, such as my domesticated life these days with kids. <laughs> so, so, uh. <laughs> You've been to the dentist? Yeah, yeah, just been to the dentist. Yeah. So, uh, I just got, just my wife, oh, mate, I'm married, mate, so she insists that I go every year. And uh, it's not that hard, oh, mate, yeah, to be yeah, honest yeah. with you. But you know how it is, mate. You've got to sort of keep up appearances and make sure that your health is all right when you've got kids and all the rest of it. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm right there, man. I'm, you know, two kids, wife, all that bullshit. You, you know exactly what it's all about, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah and I, I've been avoiding the dentist for a long time. My teeth are fucking horrible, so you know, it, it, it gets expensive <laughs> for me now. So, I bet. no fun. I bet, mate. Yeah. How's, how's yeah, things been terrible. for you recently? You've been travelling and doing much. Yeah, I mean, um, a, a lot of sort of in and out, so to speak. You know. Um, I'm, I'm not really doing touring so much as uh, as booking sort of weekend shows where I'll just travel to some country. You know, mm-hmm. you, you travel out on like Thursday night, Friday morning or something like that. And you do just show out you're on Friday or Saturday and then you just travel back as soon as possible. So uh, it's been a lot of airports. I bet. And uh, yeah, and it, you know, in the summertime, it's, it's, it's quite bad because you know, everybody's traveling in the summer. Over here in Europe, it's summer now. You know, I think yeah. it, for you guys, it's like winter or something. But um, everybody's traveling at the same time. So the, the two out of my last three trips, actually, my luggage got lost. You know, it's oh, like it's, it's, yeah. it's getting bad. Yeah, yeah. All the equipment, everything is just like, where the fuck's my stuff? I have a show. You no, know, no. yeah. <laughs> Fucking coming up in like, uh, you know, within the next like. 15 hours whatever you know and uh mm-hmm. i gotta get my gear you know i don't think you people understand how fucking important this is and you're just looking at me like i'm an idiot and they can't do anything because nobody knows where my stuff is god name and shame mate so, which airline uh, yeah. is that uh air baltic was the last one i mean they were pretty bad to be honest because um we were going over to lithuania which which meant um we actually had to to um we arrived in uh, latvia which mm-hmm. is like another one of these ex Soviet uh, Russian countries, sure. yeah, and and uh, we were going to get picked up by the by the uh, Kilkim. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this festival. It's a pretty cool festival. It's like way way into the forest in Lithuania, but it's Sweet. like three and a half hours away from from the airport. Hmm. So once you leave the airport without your luggage, it's kind of a mystery how you're going to be able to to get it in time, you know, because you're so far away from the airport and. Uh, and they're asking me like, well, what what hotel will you be staying at? I'm like, I'm not even staying in this fucking country. I'm going into the Lithuanian woods. <laughs> you <know? laughs> you got to get my fucking stuff. And I was I was getting really angry. I was like, I, I was like threatening with lawyers, and it's it's a lot of empty bullshit. I mean, I wasn't going to call a fucking lawyer. They would have laughed at me, right? But oh, you got to use what you got, though. It, yeah. yeah, and I had barely anything. So I just I was making shit up, you know. Um, <laughs> so how did you get it, by? It, it got sorted. Uh, the, the, the way that we get got by was that thankfully we decided to arrive at the festival the day before our show, so we had approximately twenty four hours to sort everything out. Okay. And um, I called into the festival as soon as I realized our stuff wasn't going to uh, get there, and I gave them a bunch of information. And they just kind of kept uh, looking into it, calling airports and calling all the numbers that they could. With, with, mm-hmm. with, you know, because you get receipts when you check in your luggage, you know, so they, they had all that information and some reference numbers and everything. So, yeah, uh, eventually uh, the stuff arrived. I mean, what kind of sucked about it was that Air Baltic didn't give me any, any kind of information about anything. It was just simply not there. You know, there was there was nothing, no messages, no nothing. And so that, that kind of made it difficult. But, um, yeah, like I said, the, the, God, uh, this... the festival uh, sort of festival management i mean they were able to finally track it down and they had another band coming in uh around the same time as my stuff finally arrived because it it, it turned out it got left behind in oslo you know they didn't even put it on the plane yeah 
because of, because of all the fucking tourists. But the plane was simply full. They could have fucking told me, and I wouldn't have had to freak out, you know. Yeah, yeah, communication, um, especially in this they, day and age with social yeah. media. Airlines and companies have got to be very particular about authentically communicating yeah. with customers because as soon as you go online on Twitter or Facebook, especially someone like yourself who yeah. is who is globally recognised, let's face it, you do have people like, for me yeah. now, I'm, I'm far away in Australia, but, mate, I'm telling you, I'm going to think twice about travelling on Baltic Airlines. Mm-hmm. You know, and this is the power of it. Exactly, and, and, and so, so am I. And, but I, I think, I, I don't know where actually they fly apart from Eastern Europe. I think I think most of their business is somewhere in Eastern Europe. And, uh, yeah. you know, next time I book a flight over there for some reason, I mean, I'm going to try to avoid those guys, you know, yeah. because I thought they handled it really fucking badly. Uh, the other one was KLM, and but that was the complete opposite. I went to Mexico a few weeks ago for a show, and uh, oh, cool! Yeah, I mean that was uh, that that was that was <laughs> that was crazy in its own right. But a bit. Um, what, what actually happened there, and I, I kind of had my suspicions that it was going to happen, was that the, the tran the transfer flight, which was in Amsterdam, I flew from Oslo to Amsterdam, and then you know uh, changed over to like you know one of those big transatlantic flights. Yep. And, and and I had like 40 minutes to make the plane, and I'm oh, I, I'm shit. literally yeah. running across this really huge uh, airport called Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. It's, it's, it's a cool airport, but it's big as fuck, you know. Yeah. And uh, I was uh, sweat was like pouring down my face. And I was just waving my passport, my boarding card, and, and in the face of the girl that was standing by the plane. <laughs> I was the last guy on the plane, and she was oh, like, yeah. "You barely made it." You know, oh. <laughs> I'm just like huffing and puffing like a fucking. I don't know. Like yeah, 40 crazy, minutes, mate. Yeah, yeah we, monster. We travel quite a bit yeah. because the wife's family's from the Philippines. So the Philippines isn't that far away from Australia. Yeah. But whenever we go to Singapore, because we have to go to the Philippines via Singapore, we always give ourselves, because we've got young kids, yeah. as I've explained. And, and um, mate, with kids, yeah. you're not getting anywhere in a hurry, even if you need to. It's not happening. No. So we give ourselves three or four hours a layover. Now, there's lots of shops at Changi Airport yeah. in Singapore, so it's a lot easier. But you still get a bit bored, yeah. but I'd rather be board and looking at shops and buying whiskey duty yeah. free um, than than having your your experience. So I did experience that a little bit once when I was in LA and I accidentally went in, back into the international terminal rather than to the domestic terminal for my connecting flight to New York. That wasn't pleasant. I did yeah. exactly what you're talking about. I did the run thing, but I had about an hour to spare. Yeah. I just didn't... American... You've been to America a few times, I understand... Flights in America, unlike yeah. the rest of the world, they can just cancel them and they just disappear off the board. So the flight that you've booked... They don't even tell you? They don't even tell you. This happened to me. Wow. And I was like, so I don't, I'm not from here. I don't know anybody here. What the hell am I going to do? And um, yeah. you, you basically and have to wait. my next flight, you know? Well, they, they force you to... Um, they give you a credit. And they force you effectively to line up, but... I, I, look, I should let you know, I host a podcast series, so a lot of the people that listen to this will be from the US. Most of my audience is in the US, but I'm sure they can empathize yeah. with me on it because they've got to deal with it themselves. But <laughs> people aren't polite yeah. either. They're not like in line. They're pushing and shoving people out of the way. So wow. as, as an Australian, as I'm sure, you know, Norwegians, every Norwegian I've met has been impeccably polite. As an Australian, we don't we have try. a... try. Yeah. Well, I've, I've spoken to a lot in my travels now as a as a indie journo and and as Norwegians and Swedish do remind me a lot of Australians. It must be said. Uh even though you're from the land of ice and snow and we're from the land of desert and rainforest and beaches, we seem to have a lot in common. <laughs> you know. You know, it's it's like uh, I I don't even recognize this country anymore in terms of temperature. We're like it. I don't know if you guys use Celsius or Fahrenheit. Celsius, but, yeah. Um you guys are with the Celsius uh, yeah. way of measuring heat. And, okay, we're at like 31 today. What? That's us. I That's mean, me. It, That's it, in it, Queensland it, here, mate. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been tropical for like four or five weeks. It, it's ridiculous. You know, it's like all the fans are just blasting all day and, uh, you know, fucking fly invasion. And I don't know what the fuck that's all about. We've got a lot of flies in the house. I think... I think my wife's theory is that it's too hot outside for the flies. They'll go into the house because the house is slightly more cooled down because you put on all your fans and you try mm. to cool it down, you know. That's, that's so really it's ridiculous, bizarre. man. It's like yeah. swamp life now for some reason. I, mean, I feel like I'm in Florida or something. 
That's uh, so. Um, yeah, that's that's real. I, yeah. I've never heard of it being that high there before. I haven't investigated it too closely, mate. Of course, but thirty-one degrees is literally what we get in my part of the world here in Australia. We, I'm in a tropical, yeah, yeah. subtropical part of Australia here, and I mean, it's mate, it's cold right now, and it's sixteen degrees. Yeah. This is about as cold as it gets for us during the daytime, and the mornings it can wow. go down to about. 16. Yeah, 16 degrees Celsius is cold for us. And I've got my jumper on, mate. Believe me, we just yeah. said we've just been at the dentist, so I've come back. But, mate, 31 yeah. is, I wouldn't say, yeah, it's not hot. You've got to get up around about the 40s for it to be really hot for us. But it's compounded yeah, yeah. by the uh, humidity, which can be really oppressive. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've been to, to a lot of different places. I've never been to Australia, so... But, you know, I mean, I've spent several days in Death Valley and shit. Like, we, we had, like, 54 degrees, uh, I think, Celsius Jeez, in the shade. Yeah. You know, that was like – that's like a dry heat. I mean, you know, you, if you don't drink water for an hour, you're you're dead, you know. It's, it's, that's, a, that's a crazy-ass place. But that's an extreme example. But, I mean, you know, going back to Norway here, I mean, this is like – it's, it's kind of like unheard of. You know, we've never – you got you got to go a long time back, I think, to, to get a, a summer that was like this in Norway. You know, it's just a really weird – what so, I don't they, know. The world's fucking going under. I don't know. What are they saying? Global warming or something like that? Is there anything, any reason behind it, do you think? Like, I haven't. I mean, I, I read newspapers more or less every day, and uh, I'm not really seeing anything about it in that. I think it's just a really warm summer. I mean, uh, I'm sure it's got something to do with climate change, you know. Um, hmm. We should bring Trump over and explain to him that this is not normal. He doesn't believe in climate change. Well, like he's he's going to be like just it. just across the uh, ocean there, the sea there. Sorry, the North Sea there, isn't he? Uh, next. Oh week. yeah, fuck. He's going to Britain, right? Yeah, I think yeah, he's in Brussels now, or in northern uh, in uh, northern part of mainland Europe, and um, but I think he's in England next week. Yeah. Um, They're going to have to close down the airports or something. I mean, the guy is so hated. You know, there's going to be so many people that are shouting at him. Yeah, they were talking about, but, uh, I just read earlier online, they're talking about something like they're anticipating 40,000 protesters, mate, um, which is just too that's, many. That's like, what do you have to do to get 40,000 people in one place to hate you? Well, you know, it's like, it, it, it's, it's, impr- yeah, to be the American president and fuck up everything, I guess, but. Yeah, it's a, it's, I look, it's a job that I don't think any regular person would ever want to do be the president of the United States, but he's not a regular person yeah. either anyway, even if he, you know, when he wasn't president and he doesn't have a filter, we know that. So he just says the first things that come. No, he doesn't, he doesn't know. have a filter, doesn't have a conscience. And he, he uh, everything is kind of like uh, everything that has value converts into monetary value for some reason. It's like everything has to be measured in cash for him. Yeah, you're right. Which is a really good so, point. You know, yeah. so obviously, there's there no morals, no ethics, and uh, obviously, the guy has absolutely no no empathy for anything or any other person, or let alone sympathy. You know, I mean, he's completely deranged, if you ask me. But yeah, well, you know, in- incompetent. I mean, uh, is the word. You know. Well, it's so, it's he's two more years. Yeah, well, two more years. Yeah, indeed. It's um, well, Australia and Mexico. Hopefully. Mexico, I think, was always in the firing line, but we were the first country that he 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 said really negative things about when he became president. There was some sort of a. I heard about that. Yeah, well, you know he, what I'm talking about. He got like about. straight on the phone, like half an hour later, he was on the <laughs> phone yelling at your. Do you guys have a president or a prime minister? I'm actually, unfortunately, not sure about that. But... Well, we, yeah, we got a prime you minister because to... we're still part of the Commonwealth. Yeah, like 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 Norway and and Sweden and stuff like that. Uh, we have prime ministers too. So yeah, yeah, same. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I I did hear that. It was that was that was that got in the papers pretty quickly. He had just gotten on the phone and just yelled yeah. at, at your prime minister and pretty much hung up in his ear. Yeah, that's right. And he and he, he couldn't even get his name right either. His name's Malcolm Turnbull, but he called him Malcolm. Turnway or something. He he misprinted. He, he got his name wow. wrong, and it was it was really disrespectful yeah. toward us because there's no country in the yeah. world that's been a stronger ally of the U.S. And there's a reason for that. I tell you, you know, a lot of younger people might not understand, but look, my grandfather fought for Australia in World War Two. You know, he uh, and yeah. he fought alongside the Americans, and he he always had yeah. very high regard for the Americans. But if it wasn't for the Americans, mate, the Japanese definitely would have been in Australia in World War Two. There's no question about that. So our our defence treaties right. rely upon the Americans, and it goes way back to World War Two, of course. But um, yeah. we've always been a staunch uh, advocate for the US, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, with a lot of what's happening with China, especially at the moment. You know, going into the South China mm-hmm. Sea and a lot of their brinksmanship with the Philippines and uh, Vietnam. Yeah, and and I think think 
for him to come out and say that to us without being aware of the history of the relationship between the two countries is really disrespectful. And a lot of people who, uh, mm. even right-wing people, people who are really died in the wool right-wing people really found that offensive because it is a very strong yeah. relationship and there's no reason why it doesn't have to continue to be strong because the relationship exists regardless of who's the president. Yeah. You know? It should. I mean, it should just carry on, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's... And, uh... Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. It had to do with money, right? I mean, everything seems to be with money with this guy. Like, you have to spend more money on this, and then you owe us a bunch of cash. That's, 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 that's basically what he's telling, like, you know, the European community now. He's just freaking out on Europe because apparently we're not paying enough money for NATO and all that stuff. That's right. I read and, that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Talking about, you know, the European community owing America so much money. Like, everything's about fucking money. How about, like, the wars and invasions we're fucking avoiding, you know? Yeah, I, I think this is this is where I really feel for the American people. You know that because the American people are are I, I, again a lot of Americans that I meet and that I speak to over the phone because I'm interviewing a lot of musicians. Obviously, all great people, but their government just gives yeah. them such a bad name globally, particularly in countries that aren't that fond of the US, as we know. You know, in the Middle East, and because of this this yeah. colonial attitude they have toward arms. You know, like yeah. the situation we're in in Afghanistan, in Iraq, they didn't need to be there. Yeah. It's not their job to go in and police the goddamn world and make it. Yeah. There are a lot of there are a lot of reasons that the world's not a safe place, but that's one of the reasons, in my view. You know, and I don't want to get any hate mail yeah. because I say that, but it's it's that colonial yeah. attitude that they've got toward putting their arms in other countries, whether it be via yeah. their soldiers or selling arms, and the world's sick of it. The world knows it, and it's not the American people. It's the yeah. people in the American government. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people working in the shadows there, now kind of like, you know, pulling strings and uh, making the true decisions. I suppose we're, we're never going to know who those guys are, you know. But you know, wrong. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of scary, scary times, man. I mean, uh, you know, every, every time Trump goes over here, he just fucking yells at everybody and then goes home and then, then cancels a few more important deals. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the world's left fucking hanging there like wondering what the hell happened throwing candy at prime ministers so what the fuck is wrong with you man <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah I, I, it's, it's like you can laugh at it but like i, I don't think we should laugh at it but i mean what, what, what are you going to do i think we're we're, we're we're finding humor in the absurdity of the situation not in his actions you know it's i mean that's it you know i mean uh that's 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 I, I do it at a much lower level you know i mean you know i was laughing at it when i lost my stuff in lithuania and yeah, I was laughing at it when I was at the Mexico airport and, and uh, realizing I didn't have equipment there either. It's like, what are you going to do? It's so stupid and fucked mm. up that, you know, I could stand there and fucking uh, I could kill myself. But that's not going to help anything, you know. No, um, <laughs> no that's for sure. It's not going to do much good. But yeah. mate, let's let's change subject because you are coming down here, and and I've got to tell you, there's a, yeah. a lot of people that are looking forward to this trip because I understand it's your first time down here. As you might have been, you mentioned before, you haven't been, but so you haven't been down here as a tourist or as a touring artist. And no, I uh, no, not in any capacity. I mean, uh, you know, for years uh, I've been kind of trying and and hinting at people and asking, hey, do you have any connections? Because I always really wanted to go to Australia, you know. Uh, a, a big reason is, uh, and, and this is a bit silly, I guess, but it's because I'm so fascinated by all the venom, <laughs> creepy oh, crawly things you have down Lots of them. There. Just, <laughs> oh, huh? Lots of them down here, okay. believe me. Make sure someone takes you to the snake farms and the uh, reptile villages. Yeah, I mean, reptiles, that's kind of like one thing. I mean, they don't they don't really freak me out so much. It's more like all the bugs and you got great white sharks and uh, like I'm thinking like this country has like all the fucked up things and I, th I think I think you guys have like seven out of ten of the most venomous or poisonous uh, creatures, you know, that that we have in the world. I, mean, I saw some less. I'm thinking, God, yeah, that's and I think, um, and I think seven of seven those seven live right here in Queensland, where I'm from. Uh, if especially when you oh, go, really? yeah, when you go up north toward Townsville and Cairns, people. Are, I've got mates that run. Look, God, God help me for saying this. If there are any animal liberation people listening, but have to run over taipans <laughs> who who will kill you. They're naturally aggressive snakes in their lawnmowers because they've got kids, and they they keep yeah. a, you know they they keep a, their lawn maintained, but they just come in when it's very dry because they're looking for food. And God help you if you're keeping chickens <clears> or something like that that lays eggs. Because I'll be right, there. Right, they, they take the eggs, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. They'll go into your house, yeah. and they're they're mongrel bloody animals. 
uh, in that they wow. are naturally venomous. And if they get you, mate, you better get to a hospital very quick smart because it's not going to end very well. Yeah. And a lot of people, obviously, right. in Australia are very, particularly in the northern part of Australia, are very educated, though, about animals. Um, you can't. Yeah. You, you, once, you have to be. Well, once you go into the tropics past the um, Great Barrier Reef, you you can't go into the yeah. ocean there because of crocodiles. I think they're called Irajiku jellyfish, the most venomous jellyfish around. That's definitely in the top. Yeah. And th those things are about the size of your thumbnail as well. So you don't even wow. know if it's got you. And there was not too long ago a young girl got stung and she was saved, thank God. But that was because she was in Cairns, I think, or in Townsville. So she was able to get to the hospital yeah. very quickly. But, yeah, it's. I've spent a lot of time in yeah. Cairns and I love the place. But it's not the sort of place you want to, uh, you want to go sort of uh, forward driving in and go into the water unattended because you'll probably have real issues with a crocodile or something venomous. You'll have an issue with a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have an issue with a crocodile. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's no one way of describing that, it. You know, one way of describing it. But, but <laughs> oh, look, the, the southern. I it's think... uh, it's just fascinating though, you know, because over here we have nothing. We got like like moose, man. I mean, I mean, you know, if you're really unlucky, you might like run into a wolf or some shit. But I mean, you know, it's probably never going to happen. You know. Mm. Yeah. So we got nothing really. So you're playing. We're so happy for it, but I guess that's yeah. Yeah, and look, you're playing. I notice you're playing three shows in New Zealand as well. So you've obviously got a fan base over there. That's, yeah. It's, it's. I mean, you're playing about six shows here in Australia, including Hobart. Hardly anybody ever gets down to Hobart, which is fantastic. In Tasmania. Um, yeah, man. I mean, I I don't know too much about the, the scenes in, in each, each city. So I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, you know, one place could be uh, fantastic and the next one could bomb. I mean, you never know, right? But um, I'm pretty much trusting, you know, uh, Martin who's, who's booking this, and uh, you know, he's been booking uh, tours before, so he, uh, assuming he knows what he's doing. Okay, so uh, gotcha. I'm just fucking I'm excited to go to to Australia. To be honest with you, I'll just play anywhere as long as I can go there. <laughs> You know. Well, yeah. I know. Tell me about the sort of set list that you'll be bringing down. Have, have you got something worked out, or is it one of those things where you'll just wait for fan feedback to see which? Because you've got, I understand you've got. Um, I might might be using the wrong terminology here, but you've got eras. Is that correct? You've got about three or four eras in which you draw your music from, and yeah, which your albums was, are allocated. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, that was something that I. It, you know, like back back in the '90s, I was playing a certain style of music, and and um, many many years later, I, I, I some someone finally came up with like a, a sort of like a category for it, which which turned out to be a dungeon synth. You know, I didn't call it that back in my days. I mean, I would call it dark dungeon music. I was also making up names for it because it, it there really wasn't any any uh, natural category to put me into back in those days, but. Um, once mm. the 90s were over, I changed my style quite radically and it became a lot more sort of programmed electronic guitar based stuff. And, uh, mm -hmm. I kind of felt like I, I, um, when I was about to put out the smell of rain, which was the first album where I really radically uh, changed sure. my musical style. Mm. I kind of felt like I, I felt like I owed it to these sort of old school fans to at least give them, uh, some sort of indication that the album that you, you, you might be about to buy is probably not going to sound the way that you expect so i put this sort of era two little indicator a uh, little little piece of text you know in the logo and that's how that got started i mean era one would never existed when 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 era one was actually active mm. if that yep. makes any sense it only kind of naturally came into existence when i decided to call my new sound era two and then since then, it's just kind of like been this going, it, it, it's been kind of evolving. You know, I, I, I changed my music style so many times that, you know, eventually I moved on to something I called Era 3 because the music was getting more distorted and noisy and angry. And once again, I felt like people deserve to know this is different. Yep. So that's, it's kind of like just been carrying on like that, but... Um, it, it kind of reaches a point where it gets a bit silly. I mean, where, where are we going to go, like Era yeah, or at twenty eight, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it's a bit, it's a bit dumb. Uh, so I kind of like cooled down on. It. Actually, when I put out um, one of my last albums called "The Great Deceiver," yeah, which I felt once again was was a rather different album. I actually decided to just call it "Era Zero, just to fuck with people's heads. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. What I didn't anticipate was that every journalist I spoke to when I was promoting that record asked me what that meant, and I had no proper response to it. <laughs> did, did you make up different did reasons was, for every journalist and just put everybody off the path? That, that, would, that, that, <laughs> that would have been typical me, actually, just to yep. talk a lot of shit for half an hour and not really even knowing what I'm saying. <laughs> and then somebody confronts me with it six months later, and I don't know what to say. And I did just, I say that? You know, look like a fool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that wasn't me. That was, that was like, yeah, that day my guitar player was doing all of it. I don't know what he's saying. His English is horrible. No, uh, I, I do all the press, you know. But um, yeah. uh, I, no, I was actually being rather truthful. I just, I just kind of laughed at it and said like, hey, you know what? Uh, truth be told, I was just fucking with people's heads because I thought that the, the, the era, three, four, five, six, you know, it, it, was just, it was just getting a little bit like, well, where's this going to end? I mean, that, mm. that is the proper response, where the fuck's it going to end? So I thought it was getting a bit silly. So I just said era zero, and I didn't expect people to ask me so many questions about it. But there you go. So uh, and, you know, that's a long answer and a very uh, oh, I'm digressing here. Um, yeah. in, in terms of like the, you know the, the, the live show, uh, uh, this is a solo thing. I mean, I've gone back to uh, to a large degree. I've gone back to my sort of nineties sound. Um, right. Okay. I've been thinking about it a lot. Thinking about that a lot in the last couple of years, like it was fun to kind of go back to the, those were simple days. It was just me. I was making all the decisions, uh, you know, no drama, no nothing, you know. And uh, visually, it was always very cool with the mask and the outfits and all that stuff. And uh, so I was kind of playing with the idea of returning to that in some form. And then the opportunity came last year when I, when I was offered uh, kind of a, the 30th anniversary of Cold Meat Industry, which was uh, one of my first record labels, and uh, mm-hmm. kind of like a two-day festival with a lot of really cool bands. So I just kind of jumped at it, and what I did is I kind of reinterpreted the my second record from 1994. Uh, oh, well, but I didn't okay. want to just perform it as, as it was, because a lot of people have heard that record, at least people into that type of music. They, you know, I felt that that would have just been kind of like okay, here's the record that you've heard a million times before exactly the same way. Yeah. So I just uh, I sat down and re-recorded the whole thing, and I added a lot of um, new pieces to it and uh, added new layers, uh, r- a lot of rhythmical stuff that didn't exist on the first one. Uh, added melodical content. I replaced all the sounds. And this made it sound bigger, more sort of epic, and, and um, more, more like if I had created that record today, that's kind of the way that it would have sounded. And... It, it also came out sounding this time around the way that I kind of wanted it back in those days, but I didn't really know how to make it happen. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, you're a mature you know, musician now, yeah, and you've I, been around a long time. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm worse than ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the worst musical theorist of all time, but I don't know anything about that. So it's, it's all in the heart and the mind, you know. Um, well, yeah, I admit, look, the album... So in that is... sense, I was probably... The album of yours that yeah, I, I'm, I'm still fascinated by because I just love the album cover is the Stargate. You know, you, you could never, oh yeah, you, you could never be mistaken what you were going to get when you looked at the album cover on that one there. And you always reminded yeah. me of, of an artist, and I've said this about a few artists, but it's particularly true for you. You're an artist that always stood within your own truth. You were never afraid to be anybody else but yourself. And, you know, I always admired that about you because I know it's, you know, you were always pegged as a black metal artist because of your history with, um, Emperor, uh, but that yeah, was a tiny exactly. fragment of your career. Uh, I think you're on the wrath of the tyrant. It is. I mean, by yeah. now, but by, by now for sure. I mean, there's just so much has happened since since you know I, I left Emperor in 1992. Well, I mean, you, yeah. you, you still get like some people. It's a long time, but 26 years ago, almost like in uh, 25 and a half years ago now, to be yeah. precise. Um, but I still do get the occasional person, you know, going uh, coming up to me and going like. I don't like anything you've done, but I loved you in Old Emperor. I'm like, okay. Oh, God. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a polite person. I'm not going to, like, go, like, well, I don't need to hear that because I don't, you know, fuck it, man. I mean, I'm glad you liked something that, I'm fucking, uh, <laughs> that I've been a part yeah. of. But at the same time, I mean, I, I could never have done that to someone else. Like, you know, someone's been around for a long time and have done, like, a million records. And I'll go, like, I don't like anything you've done except that one mini LP. Mm. That's my compliment to you. And I'm thinking, is that a compliment? <laughs> yeah. But, well, you know, they, they're, they're honest. It's fine. I don't fucking give a shit. But I find it a little bit odd, you know. Yeah, I've had a good chat to Ishan. Behind that is. Well, look, I've had a good chat to Ishan about things, actually. And um, talking to him, yeah. he's completely moved on, as you well know. 
his material these days has got more in common with Devon Townsend than it does with the old Empress stuff. So even the guy who wrote a lot of the material yeah. has moved on from it. But you do get a lot of those black metal fanboys and girls who are stuck. Even though, a lot of them weren't. This yeah. is the thing. I'm 40, so at least I was around back in those days as in my late teens, early yeah. 20s, you know. But a lot yeah. of these people weren't even around back then, but they hold on to that era like as if it's you know, the uh, the archetype of all things blackish and all things dark and doom. Yeah. But but the artists themselves have, I think every artist, and I've spoken to uh, the guys in Satyricon, so Sigurd and uh, Frost, or sorry, Sartre and Frost, I should say. Um, and yeah. I, I think even the guys in Marduk have moved on really a little bit. I know they're from Sweden, but they're a black metal behemoth, as we know. I can't think of one of the bands that yeah. was around back then that is still playing music in a similar vein to what they were performing back then. Everybody gets older and everybody evolves, including the fans, yeah, of course. Yeah, still have the same fucked up extreme attitude that we all had when we. But I mean, the thing is, I think people might forget is that we were like basically seventeen, eighteen years old at the time. Mm. So you're not even uh, properly developed mentally as a human being. So it's it's pretty natural that you're going to move on and uh, mature and uh, you know. To become a different person, you know, as the years uh, sort of pass by. Hmm. Yeah. But some some people don't really, they don't want to know about that. They just want to talk about the stuff that you did when you were like, actually, literally like in 1992, I was 17 years old. I mean, that's, that's the only thing you want to talk about, stuff that I did when I was 17. I did a lot of stupid shit when I was 17. <laughs> I was an idiot when I was 17. Hmm. You know. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I mean, you know, I said racist bullshit. Like, I couldn't back that shit up. And I'm looking back, and it's fucking embarrassing, you know. But that's youth. That's the that's folly of youth. youth. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I'm getting at, you know. It's, but I'm not saying the black metal stuff was the folly of youth. I mean, that was, like, basically fairly talented kids developing uh, musical styles and, you know, uh, unknowingly creating a genre that actually is still lasting to this day, which is uh, that's a good thing about it, you know. It definitely... A lot of it, stupidity, of course, is not it so Definitely, good. yeah. Well, look, but I think people need to be pretty forgiving of that for the fact that you're 17 and you're being interviewed and you're trying to say things that are going to get you noticed in an era that there was no social media, there was barely an internet back then, so it was a completely different era and yeah. a lot of journalists and fans... And you, you had no, no understanding of consequence either. You just said extreme shit for the sake of being extreme. And everybody thought that was cool right there and then, and you were like a little bit proud of yourself because you'd said something, got a bit of attention. And like, you know, a few years later, you go like, what the fuck was I thinking? You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, this. But it, it's, it's how it is, you know? Yeah, it is. And look, there's, there's this tendency for journalists and fans to go onto Twitter and take things well out of con context, isn't there? You oh, know? Yeah. yeah. So that badly that out of context. To this day. Yeah, it still I'll, happens to this day, man. It's it's never going to stop. It's just like just live with it. It's fuck it, you know. No, nah, good don't, on you. Don't get That's the only attitude. We're worried about it. Yeah, that is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You said something really interesting though. Outside of all of that, uh, about the the fragile by the Nine Inch Nails. You said that was one of the most influential albums on on you as a musician, which I thought was, and I read the reasons why you went into it. And I agree with your reasoning actually, because that album truly confused me when it came out in nineteen ninety nine. Do you still feel the same way about the album, and is it still having an impact on you as a musician? Well, I mean, uh, it, it, it did for a long time. You know, when I was uh, trying to teach myself the whole sort of magic of layering sounds and creating new sounds from combining all kinds of stuff and just being really experimental, then as, as far as I'm concerned, I, I can't think of a, of a cooler record. You know, uh, at, at the bottom of it, there's just all these really good songs and they're all may they're all messed with in this really strange fucking atmospheric and, and, and yet melodic way. Hmm. So yeah, that was that one was uh, was big for me. I haven't listened to it in a while now because me, personally, with my music, I'm kind of in a different place right now with, with, sure. with going hmm. back into my past and everything, which which actually ha you know was happening before I was before the fragile existed, to be honest. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was a period in time when, when I, I, you know, that that record just uh, sonically, it just kind of blew my mind every time I listened to it. It's just it's so layered and there's so much strange stuff going on, so, so many interesting things. That And it frustrates me too, because you listen to it like again and again and again, and you try to figure out like, how did it do that? And how, how the fuck did it get that thing to sound that way? Yeah. 
Yeah, but you know, it's 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 uh, a lot of it. Like my experience is that there there are so many happy accidents when you when you experiment with sound that a lot of it isn't planned. It, and I'm pretty sure it's the same thing with guys like Trent Reznor and you know Skinny Puppy guys, even like in mm-hmm. Negman, all those ultra classic, sonically mind blowing projects. You know, um, you fuck around, man, and and uh, and then something insane happens, and you keep it. You know, a lot of times I think that I think I think the best stuff isn't isn't someone sitting down and going, okay, I'm going to make a sound that sounds like this, and then five minutes later so you've yeah. done it. Yeah, the spontaneous stuff. I don't, I don't think stuff. it's like that. Yeah, I, yeah, he, happy accidents. You know. He's an artist that I would love to see you collaborate with, and I think it's entirely doable to be honest. And that's Al Jorgensen. What do you think about that? That'd be great, man. I I, I, heard, I heard it's insane. <laughs> So, uh, but that's cool. You know, you kind of yeah. got to be insane to to be someone like Al during his month. You know, but uh, the the guy the guy's catalog is um, you know uh, unbelievable. So, hmm. um, and Ministry obviously, you know, um, when I heard at Ministry, actually, I got more into in the nineties. I had a bit of a transitional process. I was going from like black metal and really underground hard noisy industrial music which was why and like electronic sort of pioneering electronic canyon dream stuff like that okay yeah very atmospheric music and i started to uh, open myself a bit more to slightly different music and stuff like skinny puppy i had a bit of a hard time and i didn't quite understand it same thing with the prodigy and even nine inch nails it was in the mid nineties to me it was too much of a mutation of things. Mm-hmm. But ministry worked almost immediately because it's a lot more sort of at the core. It's like no bullshit. It's this fucking angry, punky metal industrial stuff. And I mm-hmm. thought that was great. It took me a couple more years to really understand stuff like, you know, Skinny Puppy and Nine Inch Nails. So but once I really started understanding those bands, I mean I was a diehard fan, you know. Same thing with like you know, that sort of British, I guess what they call, I guess the media call it like big beat stuff, like yeah. you know, Fat Boy Slim, Chemical Brothers, uh, oh, you know, God, the Prodigy, yeah. of course, which I think is mind blowing. Fat of the Land is like just the biggest sounding, most mean album <laughs> you could ever imagine, you know. What's your favorite? And it's a guy with a sampler. Yeah. What's your favorite Chemical Brothers album? Because I love, I love that, those two guys. I, I see, I love We Are the Night, the album that they released in 2007. I was just listening to it today, and that, that track, uh, yeah. Do It Again, is just brilliant. And like what you're saying, I'm also a musician. I'm not an electronic musician. I'm, yeah. I play bass and bass guitar, uh, bass guitar and electric guitar, yeah. and acoustic guitar, sorry. But I, I listened to some of their stuff and thinking, geez. I'd love to get in the headspace of understanding what they were trying to achieve because this every time I listen to it, even though I've listened to that track there, do it again, probably a hundred times, I'm finding new things. Yeah, that that's what a good song is all about. I think if you can hide good stuff in there and keep 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 uh, keep keeping it interesting, you know. Yeah, what um, is, is it? To be honest, I mean, you go. Sorry, mate. You're yeah, right. go. All right. No. Um, to, to be honest, I mean, my I, I kind of stopped listening to a lot of that stuff um, a, a while ago. So I haven't seen, not that I stopped listening, so I just kind of stopped following for some reason. I can't even explain. I just keep moving on with stuff. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. But uh, I, I did buy their four or five first records by, by Chemical Brothers. And um, they did, kind of, at one point, I thought they went a little bit into techno land. And yeah, not that I the... had a lot against it, but... I didn't. I, I thought their early sound was, to me, was more interesting. Um, first album, you know, and dig your own hole, uh, you know, block rocking beats and, and and things like that were, you know, kind of like their, their their hits. I suppose I thought those were amazing, heavy, groovy, and just this, you know, good fucking songs. Um, yes. I guess the same thing with the Prodigy. I kind of like. Uh, I, I'm one of those uh, fat of the land guys, you know. And uh, some of the stuff that came after I thought was interesting, but I keep going back to like smack my big shop and stuff like that, you know. So that's a classic I track. I guess I'm a bit yeah. commercial in that sense. Oh, no, that's a classic track. And the video yeah. is amazing. Oh, the video was the first the time I'd really disturbing. been... disturbing. Yeah, well, it was the f- I mean, did you, you've, you've obviously seen the video many times as I have, but I remember the first time I saw it, the yeah. twist at the end was hilarious, as, as well as it was confounding. Yeah. It, that, that girl has a really heavy night out on town, basically. <laughs> 
a hell of a heavy <laughs> night out, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and 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 what I heard later was smack my bitch up is uh, maybe I'm out on the limb here, but it apparently it's like some kind of slang for shooting up. I heard, I heard that too. It's a slang. Um, yeah, I yeah. heard the same thing too. And I, it wouldn't surprise yeah. me. It wouldn't surprise. Me. Because you got to smack, man, to get the veins out and shit like that. I mean, not, not that I'm a big heroin guy, because I've never tried it. Never will, I hope. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, apparently yeah. that's what you got to do. Well, That's cool, man. No no, more, no morals at all, which is good. Well, for, for, for art's sake, definitely. But I'll just talk about, well, there's one other artist who you mentioned who oh, I'm so glad somebody as prominent as yourself actually gave him props, and that was Rob uh, Zombie. And the white zombie, and I think you yeah. you either talked about Hellbilly Deluxe, and you made some really good comments about that. But I think you referenced Super Sexy Swing and Sounds, which was the remix album that was released alongside of Astro Creep 2000 by White Zombie. Yeah, and I I love yeah. that album, that remix album. I thought it was a phenomenal. Uh, I thought it was probably better than the Astro Creep 2000, to be quite honest with you. Um, but, yeah, pr- at least I would say, in, in my mind, at least. Uh... Pretty damn close, as, as far as I'm concerned. But I mean, tastes do differ, you know. I, I see yeah. what you mean. Yeah, oh, I just, I just like the fact that you. Uh, a lot of people, I think, Rob's very misunderstood. He's a very smart guy. He's a guy on my bucket list that I'd love to talk to. I've listened to his interviews with yeah. Jamie Jaster uh, and also um, Eddie Trunk, and he's as sharp as a tack. And of course, he's a he's a producer these days of um, video content. So he's got the uh, House of a Thousand Corpses franchise and a few other things that he does. But musically, I've never yeah. felt he, he got enough credit for what he was trying to achieve musically. But you were really on point with your comments, which, of course, I can't recall right now because I read it a while ago. But I remember... Me the, neither. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember it was... I think it was Hellbilly Deluxe, now that we're talking about it, that you actually um, mm. referenced and said that you, you listened to that and you really tried to understand what he was trying to achieve with the production. Yeah. Um, it's Hellbilly Deluxe is... is, is um, Again, I mean, I think the sound on that is so big and so sort of, uh, you know, bad in a good way. It's, it's just this sort of big, bad monster of a, of, of, of a there's, there's a wall of sound, hmm. which I like because it means it's layered with all kinds of interesting stuff. And, uh, you know, when, when you've got guys like Charlie Klaus are doing all your sort of like mm, yeah. sample and programming work, I mean, it's it's going to be a fucking... It's going to be a monster of a record, and you know, and then Charlie Clauser, of course, as we know from um, Mighty Snails, and there's been doing tons of stuff with Manson and stuff like that. No, we all every time he touches something, I kind of feel like it's it's just turns into gold, you know. Hmm. Yeah, uh, and that's probably one of the reasons uh, you, you like super sexy swinging sound, sound, sounds. I'm listening now too. Sounds. <laughs> You're right. um, I'm pretty sure he's got a few remixes on that one, and and of course there's um, oh, American made music to strip. By, which I believe is a, is the Hellboy Deluxe uh, remix album. Oh, um, right. okay. He's got like four or five remixes on that one. So you'd like to drag your uh, all, all the Rob Zombie stuff. You'll most of it that you'll hear if you were watching any kind of like uh, the Matrix type of movie back in uh, you know the, the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. Uh, there would be a lot of Rob Zombie soundtracks featured, and uh, you know, from my memory, I mean, most of those were just. The, they were the, the Charlie Klaus remixes, you know, again and again. I mean, they're oh, fucking, right. they, they sound fucking fantastic. And just that guy makes keyboard sound wicked, you know, like heavy, heavy and dense and just like uh, groovy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was, I was uh, just like with Nine Inch Nails and even like Enigma, Skinny Puppy, you know, all those guys are, they're sound designers, you know, so it, uh, I I would I would spend little I would spend like evenings long evenings on end uh, just sort of looping little snippets from songs where I'm trying to find out like how the fuck did you make that sound happen you know again that's mm. what we come back to uh, but of course you know I mean Rob Zombie's music I think is this uh, it's like uh, I don't know it's like beyond metal oh it's disco know? metal that's it's really what it is it. if I could label it anything it's got this great. <laughs> Great, you know, okay, yeah. it's got this great beat it to it. It's danceable, I guess. I mean, uh, yeah, bump and grind. I mean, uh, mm. not that I, I, I don't do the strip club thing anymore, of course. But uh, I mean, back in the day, I mean, you, you, you would get some Rob Zombie stuff coming out on those speakers too, you know, because they're, they're, yeah. again, I mean, go back, I go back to the word groovy, which I think is the same as danceable, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Hey, I better make this my last question because I know you've got another interview coming up in about ten minutes' time. Oh yeah, so. yeah. Um, but you, you were with Earache Records for a period of time there. Um, did, 
Did you? Yeah. How, how was Digby like to work with? Did did he? I mean, I haven't heard anything otherwise. So I'm genuinely I'm asking the question with an open mind. But would you work with him again? Do you think? Um, looking at the content of my previous contract, and if that was going to be the kind of content he would offer me again, then then I would rather burn in hell. You know. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, there, I mean, here's the thing, like Digby, you didn't really talk to him that much. He, he, he was in the background. I mean, you would basically be communicating with any other person really on New York records than, than Digby. Once, once you sign a contract, he kind of disappears. Um, at least that was my, my impression. It would, you would talk mm-hmm. to guys like Dan Tobin, who's, who's to, uh, and I don't know now, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's still the label manager and he's a good guy. I mean, you know, he, he's not the guy that kind of draws up the contract and kind of, reels you in and, and uh locks you down <laughs> yeah but um i mean my fault for signing that dumb deal you know we tried to negotiate it but i mean they were pretty pretty uh hardcore and uh that was back in the day when i was getting nothing but rejection letters from every goddamn label on the planet mm. so it was pretty much a question of like okay do i want to keep remaining super underground or do I want to try my uh, luck with a label like Eric where I know at least the distribution and, and my, uh, <clears throat> my promotional, my, my PR would, would, would skyrocket. I mean, and, and then I knew that and that's why I thought I knew I was going into a pretty bad deal, but uh, on the plus side, I mean, they, they did get my name out there to, uh, you know, beyond uh, any, any, any way I had, that my name had ever been out before. So I'll, I'll give him credit for that. I mean, it did make me quite well known uh, over a quite short period of time, and and then the kind of rem- the, the PR level remained quite quite stable for as long as I was there. I mean, it might have fallen down, but towards the end, because our relationship soured at the end. I mean, there's there's no reason to deny that it was not great towards the end. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's kind of when they I think they slowly started shutting off the sort of the you know the money went away they did they, they, they did nothing to sort of promote me the last couple of years i would yeah. i would say because you were you were with him for well, about 15 you know, years weren't you i'm sorry you were with earache for about 15 years if i'm not mistaken or 12, 12 no or 15 not years, no right? not at all i mean i signed probably in late 1999 <clears throat> or 98 i'm sorry oh right okay and yep. um oh so the stargate the, was the first one yeah, so we put the Stargate out, then the Snow Rain, then the Grudge, and there was like some single, a DVD, a remix album, some reissues. Uh, so around 2005, technically, my deal was up. And I pretty much went as an independent for many, many years after that. I toured, financed my own tours, and just, just kind of did everything on my own. I became very sort of anti-label at that point because I really had very little in terms of positive experiences. I never made any money. I mean, you know, a lot of labels, they, they, they'll, they'll kind of, uh, they'll angle the contracts in such a way that you, it takes forever to recoup. Mm-hmm. They'll just keep all the fucking money. And your, you know, your royalty rates are low. And so it takes, takes an eternity for you to recoup. You have to sell a lot of records. Yeah, indeed. So, you know, I mean, yeah. So, so it's no joke when, when bands say the only the only way that I can make money is by selling T-shirts at shows, you know, because, of course, going on tour costs, costs money too, and who's going to pay for that fund, you know? It's going to be the band once again. Yeah, actually, I noticed so, uh, Bleed, you know, Bleed Records yeah. are actually selling your, uh, or the people that are putting on the tour, I think you said his name was Martin, they're actually selling the tour T-shirt right now. So I hope you I hope you get some yeah, of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, M- Martin is, is my guy, so um, we're 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 in in the same bed, so to speak. So uh, there's there's no worries there. No, great, no, fantastic. He's keeping a tap, and I'm, yeah. I'm 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 getting paid. It's not like it's 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 all it's all uh, um, what's the fucking word? It's all above board. No, I it's, thought it was it's all great. good. You know, it's all it's all, yeah. it's, it's, all, it's all it's all legal. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was great because there's been too many tours I've missed where, and I like to I love when an artist tours or is is coming through and they have a t-shirt and they have the dates on the back because I don't wear them. I just keep them as mementos and, um, yeah. and I give, give them, I give them to my sister-in-law or something like that, you know, but I, uh, mm. I really like it and that's lovely to see that the effort has gone to it. It's a nice t-shirt by the way as well. It looks like there's been some, some good effort that's gone into it. Yeah. I, I, I um, I'm pretty controlling in, in, in that sense. I, uh, I like oh, to stay on top of what stuff yeah. looks like before I approve it. I mean, that goes down to even like um, flyers, 
and then uh, you know online promo material, you know, any design like that. Sometimes people do jump the gun, and then I'll see what they've done, and I'll go like, "What the fuck are you doing? Mm. Take that away. Here's a good photo. Here's a good logo. Now start again." Yes. But that's the way it is, man. Some some people just they're, they're, they jump the gun on it, and uh, they learned Photoshop last week, and it's going to be what it is, you know. But then you know, I, I try to I try to sort of keep an eye out for horrible artwork and uh, and kill it if I can. Mm. So. Yeah. Gosh, mate, yeah. there's there's plenty yeah. more questions and there's a lot more that I want to talk to you about, but I better let you go and get a cup of tea or something like that until this uh, last from New Zealand calls you. But it's been fascinating to have a chat with you finally after all of these years, mate. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, thank you. Know, appreciate I, it. I, it's, it's, I, when are you playing in Brisbane? You're playing in Brisbane on July the 26th, and I have no idea what day of the week that would be, but hopefully that's a day that I'm free, mate, and I can get along to the show. Yeah, well, yeah. Try, try, try to show up, man. I'd be cool to hook up. Yeah, yeah, indeed, mate. Well, thank you very much for making the music that you've made and congratulations on the career as well and good luck for the tour. Thank you very much. Hopefully I'll see you down there. Absolutely. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith and that was a conversation with the wonderful Norwegian artist, Mortis. Thank you so much for listening.